that we find pi incorporated with great precision into the dimensions of the Great Pyramid of Egypt, the last surviving wonder of the ancient world, which is at least four and a half thousand years old, perhaps older, and uh, which long predates any Greek civilization. Egyptologists don't dispute that pi is found in this monument, and it's found in precisely the ratio that we need to calculate the circumference of a sphere from its radius. If you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by 2 pi, you get an exact printout of the perimeter of the base. The Egyptological theory on this is that it happened by accident, that the Egyptians or whoever built the pyramid incorporated pi in it by accident. It was just one of those things. And in, in Egyptological theory, it has to be an accident because they cannot accept that the pyramid builders had knowledge of advanced mathematics. I do not think it's an accident, and nor do any of my colleagues working in this field. And one of the reasons that we don't think it's an accident is to do with this phenomenon of precession, the wobble on the axis of the Earth that I've mentioned to you already, uh, which takes place at a very precise rate. I'm going to need to explain this in a little bit of detail. It involves some numbers. When you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by a particular value, by 43,200, you get an exact printout of the polar radius of the Earth. And when you take the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by that same value, 43,200, you get a printout of the equatorial circumference of the Earth. We think that one of the many functions of this monument was to serve as a mathematical scale model of the northern hemisphere of the Earth. And the reason that we think that is the scale used. This monument, to use one of Richard Hoagland's phrases, knows where it is on the planet. It knows what it is. I'll try and explain why. There are four key moments, astronomically speaking, in the year. The winter solstice, when the north pole of the Earth points most directly away from the sun. The summer solstice, the longest day, when the north pole points most directly towards the sun. And the two equinoxes, spring and autumn, when the Earth in its orbit lies broadside on to the sun. It's an accident of the cosmos that in the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun, which astronomers call the ecliptic, but of course at a vast distance away in space, are distributed 12 famous constellations. These are the 12 constellations of the zodiac. And because of this phenomenon of precession, the background constellation against which the sun is seen to rise at dawn on the spring equinox very slowly changes. The earth reaches this broadside on moment to the sun slightly earlier in its orbit each year. It, it's a difference of one degree every 72 years. The effect of this is that the ruling uh, astronomical sign, the ruling constellation of the zodiac, which houses the sun on the spring equinox, very slowly changes. And it takes 2,160 years exactly for the sun to pass entirely through one sign of the zodiac. That's what the old song about living in the dawning of the age of Aquarius is to do with. Aquarius will soon be housing the sun on the spring equinox as a result of the phenomenon of precession. Now, if you take 2,160 and multiply it by 20, you get 43,200, which is the scale used in the pyramid-earth ratio. And we think that it was very deliberately used to signal what this monument is, one of its functions. They wanted to build a monument that was very massive and that no reversion to barbarism could destroy and which was a mathematical scale model of the northern hemisphere of the Earth. They needed a scale on these criteria somewhere between 1 to 40,000 and 1 to 50,000. And they chose 1 to 43,200 because it's a significant scale, because their mathematical model of the Earth was keyed in to the Earth itself by the scale used, keyed in to the characteristic signature of the Earth the rate of precession of its axis, 43,200, being connected mathematically to the rate of precession. 
the intention was that in a future time, an astronomically literate civilization would be able to work out the cleverness that went into the design of this monument. What those ancient pyramid builders did not reckon with was that the site would be monopolized for 150 years by a group of intellectual barbarians called Egyptologists who cannot accept under any circumstances that any intelligent behavior of this sort could have been connected to the last surviving wonder of the ancient world. I'm standing on top of the Great Pyramid here, and that means I'm standing on latitude 30. The Great Pyramid stands precisely one-third of the way between the equator and the North Pole. Egyptologists know this, but again, they regard it as an accident. So many accidents are called for by their theory of history that I think it's time we seriously questioned that theory and stopped uh, blindly accepting it. This monument weighs six million tons. Six million tons. And its sides are perfectly oriented to the cardinal directions. The north face of the Great Pyramid faces directly towards the north pole of the Earth. The deviation is just three sixtieths of a single degree. By the way, the deviation of the meridian building of the Greenwich Observatory in London is nine sixtieths of a degree. This monument is more precisely aligned to true north than the Greenwich Observatory in London. This monument is the work of master astronomers and master engineers, master surveyors, a work of brilliance and genius, a work that we should all stand before in awe not with any certainties, but with open minds and open hearts. Above all else, Giza is a sacred place. It's a place of mystery and magic, a place that works on the imagination, a place that generates questions to those who do approach it with humility and with an open mind. We're looking at a cross-section of the Great Pyramid here along its meridian axis, north, to south. And as you can see, it's plentifully equipped with shafts and chambers and galleries and narrow corridors. All of these features are engineering marvels. To create this kind of internal structure in a monument on that scale is an unbelievably difficult task. Let's take a quick tour around the Great Pyramid. We'll start by going down the descending corridor, and then I'll take you to the Queen's Chamber and the Grand Gallery, and finally the King's Chamber. But before I do so, I just want to mention a little bit about these four shafts here. Um, the southern shaft of the so-called Queen's Chamber uh, was found in 1993 to have a little door at the end of it. The shaft is eight inches wide and eight inches high, and it was explored with a high-tech robot camera in 1993. And as soon as that door was discovered, the research into the shaft was stopped in a most sinister and extraordinary manner. And at the end of our presentations, Robert and I will be presenting to you uh, the latest information for what is happening concerning that door and also concerning a chamber beneath the Great Sphinx of Egypt. And very disturbing things indeed are happening at Giza today, and we want to tell you about this, but we'll come to that later. Let's take a quick run around the Great Pyramid now. We'll start by going down the descending corridor. The descending corridor is perfectly straight. In fact, it doesn't vary by more than a quarter of an inch from perfectly straight along its entire 350-foot length. It's 3 feet 5 inches high and 3 feet 5 inches wide. And at the bottom of it, we find the subterranean chamber, so-called. Now... Egyptologists have a theory about this chamber, and everything is theory where the Great Pyramid is, is concerned because the monument is uninscribed. There's nothing really in it which tells us what the chambers are for. It's all theory. The Egyptological theory about this uh, subterranean chamber is based on its unfinished appearance, these fins of rock that we find at the western end and, and the generally rough look of it. What they want us to believe is that after quarrying out more than 2,000 tons of rock from that perfectly straight descending corridor and painstakingly removing them from the bedrock under the Great Pyramid and having finally got down here more than 100 feet below the base of the Great Pyramid and having started to carve out this chamber from the bedrock, those whimsical ancient Egyptians at the last minute just changed their minds 
and decided to go no further because the Egyptological theory is that this was originally intended to be the burial chamber of Khufu, the pharaoh who they think the pyramid was built for. So those ancient Egyptian builders, after doing all that incredibly precise work, well, they just changed their minds and they decided to stick the body of the pharaoh somewhere else in the Great Pyramid. Actually, the body of the pharaoh has never been found in the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid was found to be completely empty when it was first opened by the Arabs in the ninth century. And we think that this unfinished burial chamber routine is a load, excuse me, a load of bollocks. I mean, it's just absolute nonsense. These people knew exactly what they were doing. Everything they did had a purpose. You stand down in the subterranean chamber, you can hear somebody sing in the king's chamber, 250 feet above you, through all that mass of solid rock. The acoustic effects of this monument are extraordinary. And one thing that our friend John Anthony West has suggested, and I think it's a damn sight better theory than the, the theory of the Egyptologists, is that what they were actually doing with this chamber was tuning the pyramid, that they were tuning its acoustic effects. And when they had extracted precisely the right amount of rock from under the pyramid to hit precisely the right note that they wanted, that's when they stopped. That's why it looks unfinished. It's not unfinished at all. It was fulfilling a plan, a function. And everything about this site is planned 